This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. We start tonight in Nain and a child welfare system involving Inuit children that is built on fear. That information is part of an independent report. It reveals how Inuit children and youth are treated when the province removes them from their homes for their own safety. As Jacob Barker reports, the child and youth advocate says that has to change if Inuit culture and families are ever going to be protected. Well, this is the report. There were over 550 people interviewed and it took over a year to write. It's called A Long Wait for Change and parts of it don't paint a pretty picture about how Inuit people are treated when they're in the province's care. Child Protective Services is not regarded as a resource, but as a source of fear, the report concluded. It goes on to say that there is an undeniable and pervasive sense of fear and mistrust of our child protection authorities. Richard Leo was listening closely at today's announcement. He has a lot of experience with Child Protective Services. I found it pretty hard, frustrating, and uh, I took the wrong route to deal with it. Now today I'm in uh, much variety and uh, working towards keeping my girls home. His two daughters and granddaughter were in the care of the province in Newfoundland. Though he still does not have custody of them, he says his fight to get them back to Nain paid off. They're now back in their own community being cared for by a family member though his relationship with the government department has been tough. Today's announcement gives him hope for the future. So we can work along with CSSD, not to work against them. We can work together. This is very important on, 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 on the same level, not one being up higher and one being lower. We're all on the same level. The 33 recommendations in the report call for government to exhaust all options when it comes to keeping kids within their families and within their own communities including providing the support needed to transition to an Inuit-led child welfare system and taking the steps necessary to ensure children retain their Inuit culture, language and values. It also says the department should focus more on prevention and early intervention. Well, it's a two-fold approach. One is immediate right now in the system as it is, make it better. And then the other piece is start working on a bigger systemic change that means it's going to look fundamentally different for Inuit children and families in the future. Nunatsia Boot President Johannes Lamp says it's been a long process, but there's still a lot of work to be done. I know there's going to be a challenge in how, you know, we work at those recommendations. So it is important that, uh, again, like the advocate said, that we have collaboration and, and uh, that, that we work hard together. I feel positive that uh, Mr. Johannes Lamp, our president, will be standing by families, not only in Nain, but in the other communities and hopefully work with CSSD and the province, uh, uh, the Sedentary's office, to improve things which need to be improved in our community. Elisa Dempster, the minister for CSSD, was in the room today listening on, and she said after the event that the province has already addressed some of the recommendations in the new Children, Youth and Families Act, which came into effect in June, and she also pointed out that there's now a full complement of social workers in the Inuit communities. But there is much more work to be done moving forward with these recommendations and of course more funding would be necessary. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Nain. To another important story in the big land, there has been no shortage of complaints since the Humatic W started servicing the coast of Labrador earlier this summer. And now passengers are speaking out about Labrador Marine's screening practices. Here and now obtained this video it was taken last week and it shows Labrador Marine staff rooting through a passenger's luggage. Note that the worker doesn't appear to be wearing any gloves and the search is happening out in the open on a dirt road. Tori MHA Leela Evans has strong concerns about this practice and I spoke with her earlier this afternoon. Nowhere else in Newfoundland or Labrador, like say if you're going over, uh, taking the, 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 the boat from uh, Port of Basque or Fogo Island or uh, Bell Island, do you do randomly conduct searches. There was no planning, there was a, no uh, advance notice. This was something that was just put together and, uh, and it's because it's an indigenous community. Now, Evans isn't the only one with concerns about this. The Department of Transportation and Work says it is also getting involved. More on that story and the exclusive video of the searches in my complete interview with MHA Leela Evans. That's coming up in about 20 minutes.
Say hearts. happy first day of school, sis. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to school today. It's Back to the Future with this back to school dad. 29 years later, Hero Now is following his daughter on her first day. That's just ahead. <laughs> Not a bad first day of school for some of you out there. Temperatures sitting uh, in the 20 degree range for most of us and mid to 20s for Central, 23 degrees for Badger. We've got some cooler air up through Labrador, Happy Valley, Goose Bay at 16 degrees, 7 degrees in Labrador City. And we are seeing a couple of systems in play over the next uh, well, as we head towards the weekend, first one is bringing some heavy rainfall to parts of Labrador and some wind warnings in place as well. I have more details on that. And then the other system uh, that we're all talking about is the potential for uh, some uh, for Hurricane Dorian rather to uh, make its way up in our neck of the woods. I'll tell you what we can expect as of now. Obviously, that's going to change over the next couple of days, but I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. An update now on a sad story that we brought you last week about a workplace accident at the new College of the North Atlantic building in Stephenville. 55-year-old Gerard Drover of Spaniards Bay died as a result of that accident. Now, Drover reportedly passed away on Sunday because of a brain injury. This days after the scissor lift that he was operating came into contact with an overhead industrial fan. Now, Drover was said to be wearing all of his personal protective equipment at the time. Mr. Drover leaves behind a wife, four children, and three grandchildren. In a St. John's hospital following a stabbing in the city's downtown area yesterday. Police were called to a disturbance on Livingstone Street at around 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon. The RNC is now looking for CCTV TV footage from that area to help with its investigation. Forensic identification officers were seen photographing the stairway connecting Livingstone Street to Carter's Hill Place yesterday. No arrests have yet been made. Big player in this province's weed business. The provincial government has signed another deal to produce and sell even more marijuana. Here now is Mark Quinn has more. Remember when the provincial government gave Canopy Growth a $40 million tax break to build a growing facility in St. John's? Well, it's done it again. Today, the provincial government announced another group will get the same tax break to build another marijuana production facility in St. John's. Atlantic Cultivation and Oxley Cannabis have teamed up on the project. The provincial government says it's a good deal that will create more than 100 jobs and bring tens of millions of dollars to the province. Other provinces have opted to use things like payroll deductions or to do an upfront grant or a tax break. We are not providing any government money to any of our agreements. We have not put any taxpayer money at risk. It's a performance-based contract, so it is up to the company to perform. As they perform and make sales within the province, the province will get a benefit, the province gets jobs, we get a return. The risk is with the company. Atlantic Cultivation will build the new facility. It says the tax arrangement means it will hire more people and produce more marijuana here in this province. Because of that, we're uh, creating more jobs, and I don't think that would have necessarily happened if we never had the incentive through the TCII. So again, I think it's an extremely effective program because they effectively created more jobs. This land behind me just off Kenmount Road is where the new facility is scheduled to be built. The land sale closed today and the company says it will start building later this month. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, parking at the Health Sciences Centre in St. John's has been causing headaches for years now. And today, Eastern Health announced that it's making a new 58-space parking lot next to the Janeway. And it's also introducing a new valet-style parking service. A new overflow parking service is going to start this month, which will mean 45 more spaces in the visitor overflow lot and 96 more spaces for staff. And according to Eastern Health, parking staff will guide drivers to a space, and from there, you'll hand over your keys and receive a ticket stub, and then the keys will be placed in a secure, organized locker. The staff member will then help get your vehicle when you come back. Well, time now to check in with Jeremy Eaton, as you see, who's taking the back to school beat seriously, as he does with all of the Eaton beats. He's at Memorial's St. John's campus tonight. Jeremy. Anthony, first of all, I want to welcome you back to the Here and Now desk and compliment you on your new back to school haircut that you're sporting there tonight. You're looking spiffy, bud. Yeah, thank you. It was two but, for uh, one deal. 
<laughs> well, hopefully I'll get mine done soon. <laughs> Anyways, you can see there's a number of students behind me. There's a little bit of video game playing going on. There's going to be some live music. But earlier today, the campus was a buzz as students were back to school. And we're going to have some of that coming up later on in the show. All right, we look forward to that. Now, staying with back to school, hundreds of students still don't know who their teachers are this year. It's because the English School Board still has a lot of empty positions to fill. CBC's Peter Cowan explains. It's not unusual for the school board to still be hiring on the first day of class, but it's a bigger problem this year. Last year at this time, there were about 40 positions left to fill, but right now the school board is looking for almost 90 teachers. That's double the number from last year. They started hiring back in May, but you get a domino effect. So, for example, a teacher at one school may apply on an open job at another, which then leaves an opening at their old school, and a teacher may move from another school to fill that job. So they keep moving and moving and creating more jobs to fill. Why is it worse this year? Well, the school board says that's thanks to a new collective agreement. This time, teachers are being hired based on seniority, so more of them decided to make a move. More teachers felt uh, that they were able to be mobile, so there was a lot more applicants for positions. Um, and because of the process, we had a lot of rejections of jobs, so a teacher would, would accept a position, and then later on there'd be another position advertised, and they would then accept that one, having to reject the other. So you have a domino effect that goes right up until August. Every classroom will at least have a temporary teacher in it until all that hiring is done. But what does swapping teachers out at the beginning of the school year do? That depends who you ask. The teachers union has a very different opinion from the board. Certainly makes for a bumpier start for somber schools, for somber classrooms, for somber members, for many, for somber students that are affected. The uh, impact will be minimized. I'm confident the impact is minimized now. The school board says it doesn't want to be in a similar situation at the start of the next school year, so it does plan to sit down with the teachers' union and see if they can figure out a slightly different process that minimizes the chaos. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, maybe you think back to when you started school, memories, maybe scary, maybe happy. Well, one little girl had an extremely memorable first day of school today because she woke up to a camera crew in her living room. 29 years ago, here and now followed Chris Tilly on his first day, and today Tilly's daughter Sophia is off to kindergarten. So here now Zach Gowdy set out to capture the moment and to contrast a dad's first day in 1990 to his girl's first day in 2019. Sophia Tilly is waking up to a new world, even if she's still a little sleepy. I don't know. Come on, you gotta eat. You're gonna be starving at school if you don't eat. Today is also a first for mom Nicole Barella and dad Chris Tilly. As much as I'm sad to see her go to school, and I know that means she's getting older, um, it's very exciting because she's going to you know, hopefully meet a lot of new friends and she's going to get a lot of new experiences over the next 13 years. There you go. For Chris, his own first day of school is getting harder to remember, but he doesn't have to remember it. Come on now, get up and have your breakfast. Now. Now, yes, it's almost time to get ready to go to school. Oh, I can now. Way back in 1990, Here and Now set out to capture the first day of school experience from leaping out of bed to the final bell. Chris wound up being the star. 30 years ago uh, seems like a long time ago, but then when you look at the, uh, the videos, it looks even longer when you think of it sitting in the front seat, you know, uh, no booster seat, um, you know, cameras going right throughout the school. So it's quite interesting to see uh, but it's certainly something that I watch still on a regular basis and friends of mine still remind me every day of my uh, Ninja Turtle uh, sheets. Times have changed, but some parts of Sophia's morning look just like her dad's. Putting on the special outfit, rushing to eat breakfast, packing the book bag, and brushing your teeth. Oh, look at Pop! Look hey, Pop's what do you say cheese? Say cheese! <laughs> but these days, Pop takes the picture with his phone. Sure, welcome, say Pop. happy first day of school, sis! Yeah. She won't be riding in the front seat like Dad, but Chris hopes Sophia will enjoy the journey that begins today. Main things I just say, have fun. Um, try to be respectful of people in your school and, you know, enjoy every day you got there. Uh, you know, my parents used to say to me, as much as I didn't believe them, that school days are the best days of your lives. And I can I certainly hope that she, uh, she enjoys every day of school because before I know it, we'll probably be at her graduation. And just like her dad, she can always look back on how it started. 
Zach Gowdy, CBC News, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips. Not a bad evening out there right now. Uh, looking outside the studio, next couple of days look a little bit unsettled for some of us, but I'll have all the details coming up. Welcome back. Oh, hi. My name's Anthony, and you are? <laughs> Ashley. Oh, yes, yes. I have a distant memory. Seems like it's been a long time. It has, all summer, basically. Yeah, well, it's good to see you again. Yes. Now, I did stay in touch with you sort of by watching some of your fishing exploits. Yes. We both got a few cod over the summer. Just a few. Right, but a lot of us sort of complain about the big fish that got away. Before we get to the weather, a story about a whopper that did not get away. Take a look at this. Glenn Best. Reeled in Sunday morning, this huge 418 kilogram tuna. Look at the size of that thing. Wow, that converts to 922 pounds of bluefin tuna. Glenn lives in Fogo, but he caught this one off Princeton on the Bonavista Peninsula area, and he and a couple of friends trying their luck because a lot of tuna were being seen in that area. And Glenn says he hooked into it around 9.40 a.m., and they had it reeled into the boat just before 11 o'clock. That's a lot of work. Oh, they certainly hit the jackpot uh, with this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, uh, they sold all 922 pounds of it to a local restaurant, minus, of course, a small feed for themselves. Yeah. That is a giant fish. Yeah, it sure is. Now, what's <laughs> what's a small feed when it's 922 pounds? That's a great question. <laughs> Anyhow, quite, quite the catch. Beautiful catch. Yep. Yeah. 
So, uh, I, I was thinking of you a lot watching some of the international coverage given this incredible weather story that's developed. Um, yeah, Hurricane Dorian. Dorian. Yeah. Yep. So you must have been busy analyzing every single model and every single yeah. one of them. Yeah, uh, just trying to figure out, you know, what's it's it's good uh, learning experience, certainly for me, uh, you know, following other forecasters and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, it's on our way potentially to, to the see remnants. us, the remnants yeah. of it to see us. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely uh, talk about that in a little bit, but we'll talk a little bit uh, closer to what we're seeing or what we did see this afternoon. I guess temperatures a lot warmer than yesterday for some areas. 21 degrees in St. John's felt uh, muggy as well today. 23 degrees for Corner Brook, and then we've got those cooler temperatures up through Lab City. Seven degrees was the afternoon high, and uh, 16 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Those temperatures uh, not moved much, just by a degree this afternoon, and uh, currently sitting at 18 in St. John's. So as we head through the night tonight, there is a uh, quite significant rainfall on the way up through Labrador. Uh, pay attention to this blue creeping up on the screen. Could we see a little bit of wet snow in the early morning hours for Lab West? Likely just in higher elevations, but the potential certainly exists there. And you can see that heavy rain moving towards the coast uh, in the early morning hours. And then eventually we're going to start to see some showers move through as well by morning for the West Coast, South Coast. We'll see that overnight and then the Avalon will see that potential for some showers as well. So uh, with that system up in the big land, rainfall warnings in place for Churchill Falls and the valley as well as Nain, Hopedale to Makovic under a wind warning with gusts out of the northwest near 100 kilometers per hour. So here's what uh, rainfall totals look like as of now, anywhere from 30 to 50. 50 millimeters it looks like some spots could see upwards of about 60 uh, in some areas in northern portion of the big land otherwise you're looking at about 20 to 30 uh, millimeters of rain significantly less as you head down through uh, southeastern labrador but overnight tonight those temperatures in the teens so another mild evening those winds going to pick up slightly even more so though as we head through the day tomorrow. Southerly winds 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. You're going to see uh, gusty winds overnight developing for the west coast uh, upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour. And then again that chance of showers moving through and then up through Labrador seven degrees again tonight for Lab City. Those winds by morning will pick up. So you're looking at uh, 20 to 40 kilometer per hour winds and then uh, sitting in the teens again for southeastern portions of the Isle or of the Big Land. So into tomorrow that rain will move through. We should see some clearing in behind uh, not until the evening or overnight hours for the metro area and then up through Labrador again. Some of that blue creeping in uh, for the Big Land. So we could see some wet flurries again, likely in the higher elevations because temperatures will uh, still be sitting as you could see from uh, what I just showed you into the single digits and or double digits. So Here's your temperatures for tomorrow. Pretty similar to what we're seeing today. 24 degrees in St. John's. Again, those winds will pick up tomorrow. We're going to see that right across the board. Uh, might see some uh, sun peak out at times through parts of central and the northeast coast as well. And then 18 degrees essentially up the coast. Gross more in 17. A little bit cooler for parts of Labrador again tomorrow especially for Lab City seeing at 8 degrees. So there's a look at your forecast. We'll look ahead to the weekend when I come back. The search for survivors is underway in the Bahamas. The island nation was battered by Hurricane Dorian, as you know, and Ashley and I were talking about that. Emergency workers are trying to reach victims and take the full stock of the impact of this disaster. At least seven people are known to have died, but that number is expected to rise. Dorian pummeled the Bahamas for more than a day and a half. And it's now moving northward off the coast of Florida with winds gusting up to 165 kilometers an hour. Now, following what Ashley told you about the local impact, a plan to shut down a section of the Trans-Canada Highway on Friday, well, that's on hold because of this extreme weather that's headed our way. Traffic delays were common on the TCH at the Avondale Interchange earlier this summer. The highway crews were replacing a culvert. That was on the west side of the overpass. Now a massive new culvert needs to go under the highway on the east side. So to do that work, they need to shut down the divided highway for four days. But the weather that's on the way, well, that postpones everything. Yeah, we have a, a, a trench that's going to be some 26 feet deep. We have a culvert that's 270 feet long. 
uh, you know, the crane operation is going to require uh, three lifts, about 50 tons each. So, you know, we need certain wind conditions. Again, this weekend's forecast is not favorable. And, and likewise, uh, the pumps that we're using to actually divert the water, the water in this trench uh, can handle, we, we've estimated somewhere around 25 millimeters of rain. And again, we're not confident in the level of uncertainty that we're seeing in the forecast models for this weekend that we can achieve that. Welcome back to Here and Now. We return to our top story, Labrador Marine's controversial searches of ferry passengers in Nain and Rigolette. Exclusive video obtained by Here and Now shows a woman with her luggage on the ground as a worker gets her to poke through her belongings. Are these searches consensual? What's the motivation and are they justified? Tori Torngat Mountains MHA Leela Evans says these searches are invasive and discriminatory. 
She wants answers and she joins me now. So, Ms. Evans, what concerns do you have about this practice? Well, one of my biggest concerns is there was no advance notice given. Uh, and also, some people never gave their permission uh, to basically, they were notified, they showed up, uh, the bags were open, and the actual crew was going through them. Not as you see there, now this is a bit later, where the crew was actually getting the woman to go through her luggage. Uh, so it, it's basically it's a questionable behavior, right? And why is it allowed to happen on the North Coast? All right, well, let's, let's take a look at this video right now just to, to sort of get a sense of what's going on with this. So as we take a look at the uh, images, what do you see here? What, what's important? Well, I, I see a woman. Uh, well, I, I see basically people from the North Coast having their luggage there on the dock in the dirt and everybody with onlookers can go and see exactly what they have. There's no privacy and it's very, uh, I would say it's uh, demoralizing. It's, uh, it's I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's very, very sad. Is the fact that it's on the ground, you don't have sort of professional searchers with gloves, it doesn't look like what happens at the airport, for instance, right? This seems sort of spontaneous on, on the ground as you see there. It, does that bother you? It bothers me because, like I says, people weren't given any advance notice that their, their bags would be searched. Uh, and what are they searching for? And why is it happening on the North Coast? Uh, nowhere else in Newfoundland or Labrador, like say if you're going over, uh, taking the, 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 the boat from uh, Port of Basque or Fogo Island or uh, Bell Island, do you do randomly conduct searches. So what are you insinuating there? I'm insinuating that there was no planning, there was a no uh, advance notice, this was something that was just put together and, uh, and it's because it's an indigenous community. That's a fairly serious accusation, so you're saying that you, you believe that this may be racially motivated? I would say that the fact that it wasn't planned and uh, it, it, leave, it leaves us open to racial profiling, discrimination, uh, bullying. Uh, um, uh, a whole host of, of things because it's now planned out and I, I don't know if they consulted anyone about the legal issues. Right. And I guess the issue you raise also, if someone's taking a ferry to Fogo and they've got some alcohol or whatever else in their luggage, those, those pieces of luggage aren't being searched no. from what we know. No. Let me ask you from a different point of view though. I mean, the argument is that some people are intoxicated, whether it was drugs or alcohol, and Labrador Marine wants to prevent this kind of behavior. Do you see any justification for this? Can you see it from, from Labrador Marine's point of view that they want to stop certain types of behavior? If this was a problem anywhere else, Labrador Marine would have put a lot of thought and planning into this process. And he would have actually, uh, I guess, looked at what the problem is because if the problem is on the boat, why aren't they addressing it on the boat, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're searching through the luggage, what are they searching for? So also, who are they targeting, right? And I so, guess as they're searching, they're also coming across everybody's personal belongings and whatever else they have in there, so it might be... No notice. Uh, right. Basically, you know, just open up your suitcase there. Uh, there was no advance notice. And like I says, people, uh, some people didn't even actually consent to having their luggage search when it happened. It certainly raises a lot of issues. A final question for you, uh, who do you think should answer for this? What answers do you want? Well, I'd like to know uh, while planning went into it is, it, is it legal? And it, it goes back to the fact that we're an indigenous community. Uh, we, we've had a lot of history where, in actual fact, we weren't treated fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of concerns there. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd like for them to find out exactly why this happened and was it planned? Okay. Uh, and well, you know, we'll know. All right, uh, Leela Evans, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, for its part, Transportation and Work sent a brief statement on this story saying they take the issue very seriously and officials in Labrador will meet with Labrador Marine this week. Well, last week, Labrador Marine defended the practice. Their operations manager told CBC Radio, in part, that they reserve the right to search passengers' luggage and the searches are done to curb the use of alcohol and drugs. Labrador Marine said its customers have the right to allow the search or not get access to the ferry. Have you got a story for us? If so, get in touch. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca. Send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at cbcnl.
Well, time now to check back in with Jeremy Eaton, who's on the back to school beat this evening, and he's live once again from the campus, St. John's campus at Moral University. So, Jeremy, are you meeting many first year students, the, the nervous ones? Anthony, we're meeting a lots of we met lots of first year students earlier today. We met a lot of first year students just hanging around here. People want to come up and say hi. They're coming from all over the world. Memorial University is a very international school these days. But earlier today, there was a bit of a mun carnival outside to welcome students back for the first week of school. And here's a little bit of the people we met and some of the action that we saw. Just here because I had some cl classes this morning, so I'm just meeting new friends and taking in the action, trying the dunk tank. What advice would you have to new first year students? Uh, go to class, pace yourself with work. Lots of people try to work outside of school. Uh, I'd suggest 15 hours a week for me. I tried to do a lot more than that and it did not work out. So go to class and don't work too much. Work on your uh, school stuff. Don't have too much fun? You can never have too much fun. <laughs> I think the weather is actually really fine. Then people people said before when I was, before people said that there are harsh winters here, but now the weather's fine and the people are really awesome. They're welcoming and really friendly and that's why I'm having a really good time here. Great University, the atmosphere is awesome and people are so friendly, I'm loving it actually. So I'm hoping to get a, enjoy this place actually. To be honest. It's a completely different environment than what I'm used to, but I'm pretty confident that I'm going to get the hang of it eventually. And uh, how do events like this make you feel, or how do events like this work to help make you feel more welcome here at the new campus? It's just really, it's, it makes it more comfortable, like everyone's like, I just started talking <laughs> uh, to Stacey over here and it's been really great. I've been able to meet people. I've been able to, you know, enjoy the campus. So it's been really great. Probably our fourth actual running of our sexual harassment booth. It's really, really important in our Always Ask campaign to engage students in a fun, engaging way to talk about a very sort of difficult and serious uh, topic that we deal with here. And um, the Always Ask campaign and this particular booth is really about uh, consent messages, sending the importance of um, you know, a reporting climate and in supporting and encouraging a reporting climate as well as um, the role of bystanders and the importance of consent. Uh, we have had a phenomenal response which is why we continue to run this particular event every year. Um, they find it engaging, not just students, but faculty and staff have also engaged and taken photos here and given us tremendous feedback. The secondary benefit, I guess, of this booth as well is that they get to take their photo strip and uh, then the awareness will go throughout the community, uh, the university community as well. So that's exciting. They'll be pinned up in, you know, uh, staff rooms and dorms and all kinds of things. So that's exciting. This is sort of a secondary piece of this uh, initiative as well. So as you can see, it's a mix of the fun and the serious. And the welcome week, weeks, I should say, is put off by the Memorial University Student Union, but it doesn't run just this week. There'll be events every night up until a week from Friday, including this one going on behind me right now. Reporting live for here now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Memorial University in St. John's. Um, I have a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old. The little guy's in junior high, and my daughter's going from primary school to elementary this year. In a couple of minutes, we sit down with some moms to talk about the new school year and find out just what's on their minds as they send their young ones off to class.
A short while ago, talking to Jeremy Eaton, you see again, we talked about undergrads. Well, what about graduate students? The number of applications for grad school has grown quite a bit, 32% over last year. And you see Jeremy there, he spent most of the day on the campus. So what's, what's happening with the, with the graduate students? Why so many? It's uh, become a very, Memorial University has become a very popular destination for graduate students to come and study. And to find out more about this, I asked Andrew Kim about it from the university. Final numbers won't be available until after the last day to register, but right now our projections are looking really good. This is a, a banner year for MUN in terms of graduate enrollment. Uh, we saw a 32% increase in graduate applications over last year, 16% increase in graduate admissions, and projecting about a 5% increase in total enrollment over last year. What's the, is there a reason for that? Is there a cause that the numbers are up like that? Um, the numbers for grad enrollment have been up over the past 10 years, um, about 40% uh, over the past 10 years. Um, and that's sort of comparatively very good compared to the rest of uh, the country. Uh, so just to give you some perspective, in the maritime universities, among the maritime universities, grad enrollment is up only about 7%. And I think all this is reflective of sort of MUN becoming sort of a, a world-class university. Um, you know, not just in terms of the sort of the academic programming and the research, uh, but also in terms of um, the student experience. And where do these students come from? Are they coming from Canada? Are they international students? Do you have that data? So we have about 40% uh, of our graduate students from outside of the country. Um, and by province, we actually have the highest proportion of international graduate students uh, in Canada. Um, but, but they really come from all over. right? And graduate enrollment, we're projecting to be up, not just for international, but also Canadian students. And is there any particular program that's luring in more students than the other? Is there any programs that were surprised, or that you were surprised to see the numbers go up? So this year we saw double digit uh, application growth uh, in most programs of study. Um, but engineering accounts for about one third of our graduate applications, and they grew about, by about 40%. Uh, and so a lot of the growth is attributed to faculty of engineering and applied science. Now, uh, is there any, like, can you pinpoint one particular reason that's happened 10 years ago to see the growth that you've seen in the last decade here? Is there, is there one thing you point to, or is it multiple things? Uh, I, I think with, with Circumstances like this, it's, it's always a number of reasons, uh, but by about 10 years ago, um, you know, I think MUN took a sort of a very deliberate approach to uh, improving sort of, you know, the, how we recruit and train and support uh, graduate students, you know, starting from the time our former or current provost and former dean of graduate studies and up to the time our current dean have been in office. Um, you know, we've re really sort of been a, tried to be sort of um, nation class and leaders when it comes to <laughs> recruiting and supporting graduate students. While no one at the university can predict the future, it says that the numbers, that trend is expected to continue and that those numbers will continue to rise. Reporting live from a very loud Memorial University, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. Welcome back to Here and Now. Most students in Newfoundland and Labrador are officially back to school, but a new year can also bring some new challenges, some big challenges. Here now is Bailey White sat down with some parents to talk about these kinds of challenges. So Bailey, what did the moms you met with, what was on their minds? Lots, actually. Uh, cell phones, for one, new school jitters, letting kids learn things for themselves. We're going to meet one mom who's got a little boy going off to kindergarten tomorrow, and another whose youngest is going to grade four at a new school. So lots for these families to get used to. We sat down at a coffee shop in Mount Pearl to hash it all out. Take a look. Hi, I'm Jana Smith um, of MSL Science. Um, I have a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old. Little guy's in junior high and my daughter's going from primary school to elementary this year. My name is Rhonda McMeekin. I have two sons at home. One is uh, two years old and the other one is starting kindergarten this year. So big transitions in my house. So Rhonda, it's not back to school, it's, it's starting school for the first time. Is he ready? Is he excited? Is he happy? He's excited. I don't think he quite knows what's coming yet. He knows <laughs> that he's going to kindergarten, but I don't think he quite grasps that, you know, school is for the next 13 years sort of thing. He thinks it's just this kind of crazy exciting thing that he's doing right now. Jana, what about in your house? Your kids, they know the grind, they know the routine. Are they looking forward to going back to school or how are they feeling? Well, my 13 year old, not so much. My my daughter, she can't wait. What did you decide in your family about when the kids get cell phones? Do they already have cell phones? Uh, my son has a cell phone, but now I decided probably, I think it was the summer going into junior high. So grade six going to grade seven is when we got his cell phone because I was kind of, he was going further away from the house. He mm. was out riding his bike late at night and I just needed that reassurance. Where is he? You know, like, 
you know, this touch base with me. Or, Where are you two? <laughs> it's getting dark, come on home, that kind of thing, right? It's almost more for you than it is for them. Yes, because I wouldn't want to be the crazy man. I'm going around after him in the van, you know? <laughs> Where are you? And that's what would happen. He knows it and I know it, so. Rhonda, I don't think your kids are cell phone age yet, but. No, not yet, thank God, <laughs> thank God. But you still have to worry about like screen time and, and those kinds of things, right? Absolutely, and um, my kids both have iPads, um, but we, we try to limit it and limit what they have access to, especially at this age. Um, my son doesn't have YouTube on his iPad, for instance, and I know a lot of other kids do, and I, w I wonder if I'm putting him at a detriment that way socially because he doesn't know a lot of the things that the other children no, I bet right. that drives him nuts. Like, mom, everybody <laughs> else has YouTube. Um, I don't think he quite he quite <laughs> grasps that yet, thankfully. But I feel like once school starts, um, that's going to be a conversation and something that we're going to have to work through. Uh, it's it's a delicate balance. It really is. Yeah. So, in a more broad sense, when you're looking at, you know, is my child ready for the next step? Whether it's uh, for the younger ones, maybe it's dressing themselves or, or having more screen time. I guess some of the marks of maturity that you're looking for. Then. I'm just looking for more like independence, like, you know, getting up in the morning, getting ready for, well, he, get ready, he gets ready for school and all that kind of stuff, but just, you know, like start taking out the garbage, trying to do more chores around the house, like showing me that, you know, uh, you know, that he can do other things besides being, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. screen time all the time. So I'm always like, if you want an extra hour, the bed has to be made you know, right. unload dishwasher or take out the garbage for me or, you know, just do a few simple things around the house for me. Maybe mm. bring your laundry downstairs. Mm. That's, that's key for me. I just kind of, <laughs> I kind of use them <laughs> <laughs> to my advantage right now. <laughs> and Rhonda, I guess it's, it's kind of different in your family, but when you're looking at your little boys and wondering, you know, am I, am I coddling them too much? Am I treating them still like infants when they're getting a little bit older? Like what are some of the markers that you're looking for? Right. And one, one of the things that, that I like to work on with them is their independence and, and especially my older fella. Um, making sure that you know he knows how to put on his own shoes and you know put on his own coat and those sorts of things. My my two-year-old is very close to his big brother. Well, and big brother loves him just just as much. They're inseparable, and uh, I don't think Seamus, my youngest, quite understands that big brother isn't going to be around every day anymore. And when we tell him that you know Finnegan is going to kindergarten this year. He goes, I go to kindergarten too. I'm like, no, buddy, not until you're five. I'm five. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think it's going to be a rougher transition for him. Yeah. I don't know, kindergarten is hard. Like, you're letting him go. I think I cried the whole Thanks for the comfort there. Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> No comfort. All I did was cry when I dropped my little boy off. I was like, Ooh. I think I was just as bad as him. Did you cry on the second day? Uh, no, because he, he seemed to get a little bit better every day, but he's more of a shy child, so he had a little bit of a, yeah. he was a little bit more shy. And my daughter, she just, she flew into school and was like, see ya, get away from me, <laughs> right? I was following the bus and she was like, get away. <laughs> but there is some change for your family too this year because your, your daughter is going to a new school, right? Yes, yes. She has a bit of anxiety about that, but I keep reassuring her that she'll see all our friends. They're going to be there too, and it's all their first day, and it's their, they're all in the same situation. So she's yeah. thinking about all that, but I think as soon as day one is done, I think she'll feel a lot better. This is tough on, on parents oh gosh, too, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. You have to find a brave face and reassuring them. That's all yeah, we can I mean, do. It's really. a total change in routine for everybody. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And um, you know, how how are we going to cope with that? You know, how are our bedtimes going to cope? I know. Um, <laughs> how how do, how do drop offs work? You know, all those sorts of things are all changing for me. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, um, you know, I, w I would be lying if I said I didn't have anxiety about about yes. all that and making sure everything's going to work out. And, School's changed drastically since I was in the system. You know, social media wasn't a thing. We didn't have quote unquote screen time. Um, you know, bullying seems to be so much more pervasive. And I don't know if it's pervasive or if we just hear more about it. But you know, those are the sorts of things that I worry about. It's not it's not the learning or the, the social integration, I don't think. It's going to be those those unknowns to me because it's not something I had to deal with. Going back to school is sometimes a good thing, I yeah. think, for a lot of people. But then, you know, it, it is scary, and I do worry when they go back to school. You know, my son's going to grade eight, and I, I, I do stress over junior high more than anything. Yeah. Just because it's, it's, you well, know. Well, talking about the social media and yeah, the bullying like, and stuff, yeah. that's what and it was a big yeah. change for me last year when he went to grade seven. It was just, you know, because you're getting all these different kids from different schools, and mm -hmm. I was worried, but, you know, it worked out, and he was fine, but you got to stay on top of it all the time. Do you have any advice for Rhonda? 
No. <laughs> no, I, she's I'm, already been so comforted. <laughs> I think you're, she's going to be fine. Her son sounds like he's outgoing, and I think he's going to do great. Yeah. I hope so. It's just us that need help. <laughs> really. <laughs> We're the ones that are worrying yeah. all the time. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me, and very best of luck in the new school well, year. Thank you. thank you so much. Midweek now, a lot of people talking about the weather. Of course, we've already spoken with Dorian, uh, but tomorrow, Thursday, tomorrow's weather. Yeah, we're going to just quickly uh, go over tomorrow one more time. It does look a little bit unsettled for areas. Mm -hmm. Take a look at the forecast 24 degrees, so temperatures should be a little bit warmer than what we saw today, but those winds you'll notice will be much stronger and generally out of the southwest gusting upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour may see stronger gusts along those coastlines. Uh, otherwise, temperatures towards the west coast sitting around uh, 17, 18 degrees, so in those high teens, it's up through Labrador where most of the weather will be and we're going to see some strong winds where we have those wind warnings along the coast and then uh, rainfall warnings for Nain, Churchill Falls and the valley where we could see uh, upwards of about 60 millimeters of rain by the time Friday morning rolls around. So uh, there's a look at that low pressure system spinning and why we're seeing that southwesterly flow uh, for the island. But Friday actually looks pretty beautiful for most of us as we see uh, plenty of sunshine through the day that rain will clear out and things will eventually clear up uh, late day on Saturday for parts of the big land. So here's a look at your temperatures for Friday, dipping a little bit. So we're going to go back down into the teens, high teens, but again, plenty of sunshine. Corner broke 15 degrees, uh, the straits around 14, those single digit temperatures along the coast. Again, for Nain, Lab City sitting at nine as well. But again, that sun should peak out for uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay just a little bit. Uh, mainly cloudy skies will be the story for you. Looking a little bit forward, that's what we're all uh, talking about right now, and that's Hurricane Dorian. The latest forecast just came out from the Hurricane Center, and it has strengthened a little bit. Uh, just a high Category 2 right now at 175 kilometers per hour. If we take a look at the track, though, similar track along, hugging the coastline, then it speeds up and heads towards us by the time Saturday rolls around and into Sunday. So uh, as of now, the Hurricane Center is showing or saying 
it will be a strong uh, extra tropical low by the time it makes it to our uh, or to the island rather. And again, anywhere in this cone is where we could see that landfall. So don't take that into account as of now, but it does look like significant rainfall, certainly for uh, the Maritimes, at least Nova Scotia and heading towards uh, us as well. So here's a look at uh, what we're expecting as far as those winds go. It looks like uh, potential for sustained winds of 65 kilometers per hour, certainly uh, for the uh, southeastern portion and then towards the island. It gets a little bit cut off, but it's closer to 30. So we are looking at that chance of showers, certainly and some strong winds, but the forecast track still many days away. Uh, but here's what it's looking at. So temperatures sitting around 19 degrees as we head towards the weekend, a few sunny periods in between that and then uh, same thing for central Newfoundland. 16 degrees for Sunday, similar for Western Newfoundland and then up through Labrador is where we get into some of that uh, cooler air as we head towards the end of next week and certainly for Western Labrador. Well, I want to know where you're to mm. take a look at this beautiful photo. We've had a couple uh, astronomy <laughs> photos. The stars are fantastic. Absolutely gorgeous. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back. Well, uh, I showed you just before the break a beautiful shot of the Milky Way and this photo nice. it is gorgeous was taken in New Melbourne, which is close to Hans Harbor. Okay. Yeah, nice so spot on the Avalon. On too, the Avalon. Nice That's right. It's hard to believe but uh, Ryan Brown sent us this clear starry night. Thank Best you. real estate listing I've ever seen. I'd say. Can you imagine? <laughs> thank, you so, yeah, thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah. Good to be back. Nice to see you. You're leaving, yes, so I'll see you whenever I, I see you. Carolyn Stokes <laughs> is back doing She's weather She's going to do tomorrow. the weather, okay. so she'll take you through uh, what we're expecting. All right. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Have a great night. <laughs> Good night.